Hi, and welcome to the American Society of Echo E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join E3 Special Interest Group, log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then E3. Today's lecture is the first of four lectures in the E3 Structural Heart mini lecture series. Today's topic is on imaging for the left atrial appendage, and joining me today as my co-moderator is Dr. Varsha Tanguturi. Dr. Tanguturi completed her training in cardiology and echocardiography at Massachusetts General Hospital and was recruited to join the staff. In addition to patient care, she reads transthoracic echocardiograms, performs transesophageal echoes, and participates in procedural guidance for Watchman device implantation. Her primary focus of investigation is the utilization of echo in the treatment of valvular heart disease. Welcome, Dr. Tanguturi, and thank you for joining me today. Our physician expert is Dr. Mohamed Sarek. Dr. Sarek is Director of Echocardiography and Professor of Medicine at New York University Langhorne Medical Center in New York City. He received his medical degree from University of Servio Faculty of Medicine and his PhD from New York University. His primary interest is the use of 3D echo in providing percutaneous repair guidance for structural heart disease. Dr. Sarek has published hundreds of widely cited articles and book chapters in the field of echo. He was the chairman of the American Society of Echo Guidelines Committee for the use of echo in the evaluation for cardiac source of embolism, and has multiple publications related to left atrial appendage occlusion device imaging. He is frequently invited to give presentations and lectures at medical conferences, institutions throughout the world, and has been a recipient of multiple teaching awards. He is truly an expert in this topic, and I thank you for joining us tonight. Yes. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Brian Gentile. Dr. Gentile has earned his medical degree from Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine, and completed his internship, residency, and fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he stayed on as faculty and serves as the Director of Interventional Echocardiography and co-director of the Left Atrial Appendage Occlusion Program. His clinical interests include multimodality approach to cardiovascular imaging and imaging guidance of transcatheter structural heart interventions. Welcome, Dr. Gentile. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, and, and what a kind introduction, and it's an honor and a uh, privilege to join this uh, distinguished panel. So as you mentioned, today's topic is going to be the imaging guidance for left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, one of my favorite topics to speak about. So we'll start speaking about atrial fibrillation and embolic risk, and specifically what we're going to talk about today is what used to be called non-valvular atrial fibrillation, which we now call atrial fibrillation in the absence of moderate or more mitral stenosis. And as we all know, that associated with AFib is a risk for thromboembolic events, and that risk is constant, whether we're pursuing a rhythm control strategy or a rate control strategy. And what's important to remember as it pertains to this topic is that in patients without rheumatic mitral valve disease, 91% of thrombi localized to the left atrial appendage. And this all comes from a seminal paper that came out in the mid 90s. That was an autopsy study that looked at all patients that had had a stroke and whether they went to autopsy or had a TE. And it found that over 90% of thrombi in patients without rheumatic mitral valve disease localized to the left atrial appendage. So we all know that the risk of thromboembolism increases as the chads vask score increases, and we can reduce this risk with oral anticoagulants, so whether that's warfarin or the direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, 
And I, as I'm sure you do, I counsel my patients that when we start oral anticoagulants, there are a risk of bleeding. But I tell them that not all bleeding is created equally. So if you were to cut your arm, that would be a relatively minor bleed. Whereas if you were to have a hemorrhage intracranially, that would be much more substantial. So I quote them the, the risk of bleeding from the seminal papers out of the New England Journal, that about a 3% risk of major bleeding, about a 1.5% chance of GI bleeding, and less than 1% chance of intracranial hemorrhage. So it's easy to know what to do when the risk of thromboembolic events outweigh the risk of bleeding. But what do we do when the risk of bleeding outweighs that of thromboembolic events? And this is where left atrial appendage occlusion devices come into play. They offer us an opportunity to reduce thromboembolic risk in patients that are unable to tolerate long-term oral anticoagulation. And whether that's due to bleeding, labile INRs, or frequent falls. So the most appropriate place to start is imaging the left atrial appendage itself. And you'd have to think about its anatomic location. And when I started out as an early faculty member, I would debate with one of our cardiac surgeons about the location of the left atrial appendage. She would maintain that the left atrial appendage was a posterior structure, while I would argue that it was an anterior structure. And it turns out that we're both right. It just depends on what part of the appendage you're dealing with. So the ostium of the left atrial appendage seen here on the CT scan is a posterior structure. So surgeons, when approaching the left atrial appendage to oversew it or to close it, are looking at the ostium of the appendage. Whereas as echocardiographers, when we're screening for thrombus, we're often looking at the tip, the apex, and the body of the left atrial appendage, which is an anterior structure. It's all the way out here by the main pulmonary artery. So what does that mean for imaging the left atrial appendage? Well, by our traditional mid-esophageal four-chamber view, it's going to be challenging to image the appendage from that view. So what we need to do is move our TE probe to a higher esophageal orientation and provide plenty of anti-flexion on the probe to deliver the ultrasound beam through the body of the left atrial appendage. In addition, the left atrial appendage is rotated within the heart, right? So similarly, we must turn our crystal array out to a high angle view, about 130, 135 degrees, to deliver the beam through the full body of the left atrial appendage. And in doing this, we're actually able to visualize the entirety of the left atrial appendage. So I tend to image the appendage every 10 to 15 degrees, and I'll record an image every 10 to 15 degrees when I'm screening for pathology and I'm looking for thrombus. In general, when we're thinking about measuring the left atrial appendage, which we'll get into later, we tend to take about four different views, 0, 45, 90, and 135 degrees. And this helps us understand the morphology. So at lower angle views, 0 and 45, the appendage often looks like a windsock morphology. But as we get out to that high angle view, we're cutting through the main part of the appendage. And we can see that it takes interesting morphologies. In this case, it's got a little tail down here and another accessory lobe here. Similarly, CT scan, you must rotate as well. So you can't just use your three typical views, your axial, your coronal, and your sagittal views. This is the same left atrial appendage that you're seeing echocardiographically on the left of your screen. And notice that we need to get out to that typical REO caudal view and that REO cranial view to truly understand what the morphology of this appendage is. So in obtaining these views, we can determine the morphology of the appendage. It's important to remember that every left atrial appendage is different. It's very much like a fingerprint, even though we group it loosely into four different categories, whether that's cactus, chicken wing, windsock, and cauliflower. Our fellows will often ask me, does it really matter what the morphology is? And there's some data on this. This was a study back from the uh, early 2010s, and this looked at morphology of left atrial appendage. So they did all these TEs and then grouped them into patients that had had a prior stroke or a thromboembolic event. And it turns out that patients with a non-chicken wing morphology we're more likely to have had a thromboembolic event in the past. Doesn't prove causality again, just something interesting to note. So speaking of thromboembolism, the next portion of approaching left atrial appendage occlusion is to screen for pathology. And so I'm not gonna fool anyone on this panel or anyone in the audience here into thinking that this is a thrombus, but what is this? This is a reverberation artifact, it's a mirror image artifact, right? And as an early attending, I would just drop an M mode through this and I'd see that it follows the atrial ridge perfectly and it's unlikely to be a thrombus. With a little bit more experience, I've 
I found a good way to teach our fellows in how to exclude thrombus in this situation. So what I would do here is I'd actually advance my probe a little bit further, provide a little bit more antiflexion, and in doing so, move the atrial ridge to the right-hand side of the screen. I can see throughout the body of the left atrial appendage here and exclude thrombus in this field. So thinking about pathology, here's an example of a thrombus within the apex of the left atrial appendage in a patient that had an amyloid cardiomyopathy. Now in our lab, this is a patient that we would not approach for percutaneous closure at this time due to the risk of embolizing that thrombus out of the appendage. We would treat this patient with oral anticoagulation and bring them back for closure. And we've done that successfully on a number of occasions. On the other end of the spectrum, you all know what this is. This is smoke or spontaneous uh, echo contrast seen in the body of the left atrial appendage and throughout the left atrium. There is an increased risk of thromboembolic events compared to a, a matched group. Um, but in general, these patients can have their appendages occluded or even cardioverted uh, without increased risk of, of events. So this is a patient we would feel quite comfortable closing. It gets a little bit trickier with this. So what is this? This is what's termed in the literature as sludge. So it's a similar phenomenon to spontaneous echo contrast. It's more viscous, it's more gelatinous, and it, it has, carries a higher risk of thromboembolic events. So it's a little trickier to know what to do in these circumstances. So when I come across a patient like this that we're planning on closing the appendage, our fellows will often ask, well, can we just turn on 3D and look down the barrel of the appendage and determine if it's thrombus or not? So I say, sure. Here are the same patients with 3D echo, right? So looking down the patient with smoke, the barrel of the appendage looks pretty clear. I'm not entirely sure I see the apex there. The opposite end of the spectrum, very clearly a thrombus here. But in that patient with sludge, what is this? I don't know. It's I don't feel very comfortable cardioverting this patient, let alone uh, just simply occluding the appendage, right? I can't entirely exclude thrombus. So in our lab, how do we exclude thrombus in these patients? So again, this is that patient with sludge. This is what their pre-screen CT looked like. Notice that there's incomplete filling between these pectinate here. So what we like to use in our lab are ultrasound enhancing agents, or what we used to call echo contrast. And this was Definity Contrast, and notice it fully opacifies the left atrial appendage, getting nicely out in between those pectinate, and this was a patient that we felt quite comfortable proceeding with appendage occlusion, and uh, this patient got a very nice result. The American College of Cardiology supports you in the use of echo contrast to clear the appendage, and uh, many talks on the use of echo contrast uh, support this. So this is something that is frequently employed in our lab. So when in doubt, if you cannot exclude thrombus, you should use or consider using uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. So on to left atrial appendage occlusion devices. I'm gonna speak about three different devices today. Okay, I know there are a variety out on the market, but the three that I wanna speak about today are the original Watchman device, which we call the Watchman 2.5 device, the latest generation, which is Watchman Flex, and the Amulet device, which is currently under investigation, and hopefully will be available to us uh, in the near future. So what's important to remember about these devices is you have to understand what they look like ex vivo to understand what they look like in vitro, okay? So the Watchman 2.5 device is a about as long as it is wide, and that has certain implications which we'll get into. It has an exposed threaded insert and an open distal end. Compare that to the Watchman Flex device, which about, is about half as long as it is wide. It's got a closed distal end. The fabric extends about two thirds of the way down the device, and it's got a recessed threaded insert. The amulet device is what we would call a disc and lobe device. So there's a lobe that anchors the device inside the body of the left atrial appendage. And there's an atrial disc here that seals off the atrium from the rest of the appendage. So prior to approaching appendage occlusion, our lab, we do a pre-implant transthoracic echo. If we have one that's on file within the last couple of years, that's perfectly acceptable. What I'm specifically looking for is biventricular function. I don't want any surprises on the day of implant. We want to look for valvular disease, right? Specifically rheumatic mitral valve disease. If a patient has rheumatic mitral valve disease, 
they probably should not be getting a left atrial appendage occlusion device. I wanna look at septal anatomy. Is there a large ASD that I need to deal with? More importantly, is there a septal occluder that's gonna be hard to navigate or is there a pericardial patch across the septum? And finally, I wanna know if there's a pericardial effusion. Many centers are still doing a pre-implant transesophageal echo to screen for pathology, to size the left atrial appendage, and to look at atrial septal anatomy. So here's a patient who had undergone a screening transesophageal echo that did not have a prior transthoracic. And one of the things that we quickly noticed was this hypoechoic region here along the right ventricle out at the apex. And the concern was, is this represent a pericardial effusion before we go ahead and place any devices inside the heart? I wasn't entirely sold that this was a pericardial effusion. I noticed some echogenicity within there and certainly another echo density below that. So remember that transthoracic and transesophageal echo are not competing imaging modalities. They are complementary imaging modalities. And you have a whole toolbox at your disposal there on your echo cart. So we quickly just took out our transthoracic probe and got a quick subcostal uh, view here. This is my handiwork. I'm not as accomplished a uh, transthoracic echocardiographer <laughs> anymore. But notice, this is pericardial and epicardial fat here, right? So this is not an effusion. This is just fat that's in the far field and much more challenging to distinguish. So just remember, not competing modalities. They're complementary modalities. So now we've entered the procedure for left atrial appendage occlusion, and we're going to begin by sizing the left atrial appendage. And I'm going to go over Watchman sizing first. As I mentioned, we're going to size at four different angles, 0, 45, 90, and 135 degrees, about there. It does not have to be exact. And what I'm typically doing is I'm obtaining what I find is a comfortable landing zone for this device, okay? The classic teaching is you take it at the level of the circumflex artery to a point that's one to two centimeters distal to the atrial ridge. So I just try to find a comfortable landing zone here and make measurements at all four angles. And then I measure into the deepest part of the appendage, which was much more important for the Watchman 2.5 device than it has been for the Flex device. There are sizing charts. There is overlap for both 2.5 and Flex that helps us decide which device to use. And truth be told, we generally approach each procedure with two different device sizes in mind. And what we'll do is we'll correlate our transesophageal echo with our fluoroscopy images and CT imaging if available to decide on the final device size. Amulet is sized a little bit differently. There are three different measurements that you're going to make. You're gonna measure the true ostium of the appendage here from the level of the circumflex all the way to the tip of the atrial ridge. But truth be told, the most important measurement is going to be a point 10 to 12 millimeters distal to that. That is where your lobe of your amulet device is going to be anchored. Again, you're going to measure these out at all four angles. And the important thing is that the depth measurement is not going to be into the deepest part of the left atrial appendage. It's actually going to be perpendicular to where your measurements are. Again, there's a sizing chart Sizing is mostly determined by the size lobe, the measurements that you're getting down here. I use a fair amount of multiplanar reconstruction with 3D echo to size the appendage, particularly in anatomies where I'm not quite confident on where the landing zone is at 135 degrees. So this is an instance where I wasn't sure if my ideal landing zone was here, was it up here? So what I did was using multiplanar reconstruction, I defined a landing zone at 45 degrees here, and I was able to find that corresponding location at 135 degrees, and I could make my appropriate measurements here. Since this is an echo talk, I'm not gonna harp on this, but many people ask, can I use CT to size the left atrial appendage? And the answer is yes, many centers, including ours, are using CT to size the appendage, uh, prior to the procedure day. It's important to remember that you're not going to use your traditional three slice CT. You're going to use multiplanar reconstruction to develop an RAO caudal and an RAO cranial view and measure the appendage in those views, which correspond to our high angle. So RAO caudal corresponds to our high angle, about 135 degrees, whereas RAO cranial corresponds to our 45 degrees by transesophageal echo. So appendage occlusion with the Watchman device. The first thing we're gonna do is perform a transeptal puncture. 
the classic teaching is inferior and posterior. I say classic teaching because the school of thought has changed on that more recently. In our lab, we tend to customize our transeptal puncture based on our morphology. So if we're dealing with a significant wing and we need to be out in the chicken wing to uh, gain adequate depth, we may approach it with a more anterior puncture. So how do we define these anatomic locations to help our proceduralist get the appropriate transeptal puncture? So it's important to start with a bicaval view, which is going to define superior and inferior, superior out where the SVC is, inferior where the IVC is. And then we'll use an aortic valve short axis view to define anterior, anterior being where the aortic valve is and posterior being away from that. I like to use biplane imaging, right? So simultaneous superior and inferior and anterior and posterior. And that way we get the optimal transeptal puncture. I will encourage you to spend a little bit more time on your transeptal puncture rather than rushing it. Spending a little bit more time and getting the right transeptal puncture can save you a significant amount of time down the line. So once we're in the left atrium, we're gonna deliver our Watchman catheter into the left atrium via the pulmonary vein. So we anchor a wire in the pulmonary vein, which I was verified by 2D and 3D echo. Most of the time you'll end up in the left superior pulmonary vein. Sometimes we do end up in the left inferior pulmonary vein. Which vein you end up in is less important as long as you can image it. And then using that as a rail, you can deliver your Watchman catheter into the left atrium. Once in the left atrium, we're going to deliver the Watchman catheter into the appendage over a pigtail catheter. This is important in the PROTECT uh, AF trial, the, the seminal trial for left atrial appendage occlusion. Uh, using a pigtail catheter actually reduced the rate of pericardial effusion by 50%. So remember, always entering the appendage with a pigtail catheter. I like to turn on 3D volume rendered imaging here just to get a view of how relaxed we are within the appendage. Are we riding the mitral surface of the appendage? Are we riding the atrial ridge here? How comfortable are we within the appendage? So once we're in the appendage, we're going to deploy our device. So here is a 2D image and a 3D image of a Watchman flex deployment. There's two different schools of thought on technique for this. Some centers deploy the flex ball, which you can see right at the beginning of this video, in the body of the left atrium, advance it into the left atrial appendage, and then unsheath the device. In our center, we tend to start by deploying the flex ball distally within the left atrial appendage and walking the device back to the ostium, providing forward pressure to tamp down the device in the appendage and seal off the appendage. Finally, we'll take a quick look at the device, make sure that it's stable. We'll get into past criteria in a few minutes. Uh, just to make sure that we're happy, we haven't missed any major invokes. The amulet device is a little bit different. You're delivering an amulet ball in the left atrium or at the awesome of the appendage and then advancing it into the left atrial appendage where you're then expanding it into its full form. So this is the anchoring lobe of the device. Once you're satisfied that the lobe is anchored, you're gonna deliver the atrial disc, which then gets tamped down, sealing off the appendage from the rest of the left atrium. So once the device has been deployed but not released, we're going to do a quick assessment. And with the Watchman device in our lab, we still go through the pass criteria each time with the first P being position. Am I happy with the location of this device? Are all lobes of the left atrial appendage at or distal to the face of the device? I think of this quick diagram with every device that we deploy. The ideal deployment is where the shoulders of the device sit at the level of the circumflex at where the, the landing zone is. And that means that less than a third of the device is outside of that landing zone. This is a perfect device, okay? If the device is a little deep, that's actually okay. This is a good device, we'd be happy with that. The only thing you wanna watch out for is that you haven't missed any proximal lobes, part, uh, particularly posteriorly. If the threaded insert is at the ostium of the appendage, this can be okay, but I will tell you that there is a risk of mixing a more proximal lobe uh, posteriorly. There's also potentially a higher risk of device-related thrombus. So nowadays what we would do is we would slowly walk this device back to the ostium of the appendage. When I start to see more of the device outside of the appendage, I get worried 
it's unlikely that that device is going to be compressed and therefore stable. So I would proceed with caution. If more than half of the device is outside of the left atrial appendage, this is not something that we would leave in our lab due to its risk of embolization. Next, we're gonna check its anchor. This is a stability test, and this is a tug test. We tend to do about three to four tugs on the device. The first tug often settles the device, so it may shift, it may move after your first tug, and that's why it's important to do multiple of these. What I wanna eventually see is that as we tug on the device, it comes right back to its original position. Next, we're gonna look at size, and by size, I mean compression. And for the Watchman 2.5 device, we allow anywhere from eight to 20% or more compression. With the Flex device, we're really looking at 10 to 30% compression. It's important to see the threaded insert of the device. If you do not see the threaded insert, you are foreshortening the device and thereby overestimating compression, right? So you're falsely reassuring yourself. It's important to remember that with the Watchman Flex device, the shape of the device changes the more the device is compressed, right? It's got a closed distal end. So the more you compress it, it's going to elongate. You can see the different shapes over here. Finally, notice that this is the last step. We're going to check its seal. And we're gonna use color Doppler to do that. You may need to go off axis in imaging to find these leaks. And I like to set a low Nyquist limit because the flow into and out of the appendage can be quite low. It's important you wanna measure the vena contracta, the narrowest orifice, just like you would for mitral regurgitation, not the blooming. So here's an example of vena contracta. This is what we want to measure, not the blooming. Here are a tale of two different devices. This is a device that has a very small vena contracta and some blooming around it. This is a device that got caught up in pectinate and did not occlude the appendage, a large vena contracta. Note the low velocity flow here. I point this to show you just what a difference a year makes. So this is a device that had a small leak at 45 days. They came back a year later uh, for uh, bacteremia. I did a transesophageal echo on them and that leak had uh, gone away. The assessment of the amulet's a little bit different. We're mainly gonna pay attention to the lobe here. I wanna see that it's a tire shaped, that there's separation between the lobe and the disc. That tells me that the disc is being pulled toward the lobe. I wanna see that the disc has a concave shape relative to the atrium, again, being pulled toward this lobe. And I wanna know that the lobe is, two thirds of the lobe are below the level of the circumflex. We do a little bit of 3D to assess the device post deployment. I like to start by putting a light source behind the occluding device, just to see if there's any large gaps there that I have to go and find on 2D and color Doppler. Now, as important as it is to guide our proceduralists uh, in deploying these devices, it's also important for us to have their backs and monitor for complications. So notice here's a pericardial effusion around a Watchman device. It's important to know if that was there at the start of the case, and that's why you need to do a complete assessment of the appendage. If that wasn't present at the start of the case, you have to be concerned about a perforation and a developing pericardial effusion. It often starts as fluid behind the appendage, Later, it will develop as fluid uh, uh, circumferentially. Here's a Watchman device that is embolized and is in the descending aorta. These can be removed percutaneously. And here you see a Watchman device that's been embolized in the left atrium. Uh, the team here is trying to grab this with a gooseneck snare and they're gonna pull it across the atrial septum. So where else can these devices go? They can also end up in the mitral apparatus. So here's a Watchman device in the mitral apparatus. Here's an amulet device that's in the mitral apparatus. These patients should really go to surgery. You do not want to mess with the mitral apparatus. And why is that? So here's an example of a wire, a stiff wire that got caught in the mitral apparatus. And upon its removal, the patient developed severe mitral regurgitation due to shearing of the cords there and ultimately needed a mitral clip. Finally, we're going to look for device-related thrombus, right? So here's a DRT sitting on top of a Watchman device. This also happens on top of an amulet device. So it's important to look for these because they have implications about continuing oral anticoagulation. At 45 days, we're going to do a follow-up and determine if these patients can come off of their oral anticoagulant. So what I like to look for is I like to look for stability, making sure the device hasn't shifted, making sure there aren't uncovered lobes. I wanna look at leaks. So are there new leaks or have the leaks grown, right? That'll have implications for 
discontinuing oral anticoagulation. Importantly, I wanna look for a device-related thrombus as these patients would need to continue their oral anticoagulation. Finally, we'll look for an effusion and see if the transeptal puncture has closed. With that, this is my last slide here, just some final thoughts. Uh, this is a team approach, right? So it's a team approach between EP, interventional cardiology, and us as echocardiographers. And I want you to remember that TE, fluoroscopy, and CT are complementary imaging modalities. They are not competing with one another. Remember, the appendage has a complex morphology, whether it's a chicken wing, windsock, cauliflower, or a cactus. You have to view it at multiple different angles in, in order to truly understand what the morphology is. Don't forget to look for pathology, whether that's thrombus or sluggish filling, which we call smoke or sludge. If you're in doubt, don't guess. Use ultrasound enhancing agents, use contrast. You wanna be sure the stakes are high. Finally, transesophageal echo is still integral to left atrial appendage occlusion. Whether that's pre-procedural planning, multiplanar reconstruction in 3D can be helpful. Many centers use CT. It's essential for your intraprocedural guidance, whether that's the an inferior and posterior, an inferior and anterior transeptal puncture. It's integral to device deployment, post-deployment assessment, and really important for monitoring for intraprocedural complications. And finally, TE is still the gold standard for the 45-day follow-up and helping determine whether these patients are coming off of their oral anticoagulant. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to uh, Lucy and Varsha. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gentile. That was a wonderful uh, presentation, very thorough and, and very informative. Um, you know, I have a question I wanted to ask um, our expert today. Uh, you know, with the new device that's on the market now, the Watchman Flex device that really you can adjust and redeploy as needed, is there, um, in your opinion, what amount of peri-device leak is acceptable and um, is, if any? That's the first time. That's a very great question, Brian. Thank you so much, really, for extensive um, presentation on all the aspects of the device. Um, and I, Lucy, I agree with you that uh, with the advent of new device, uh, Watchman Flex, um, there is really more flexibility in how the device is implanted, and we all should strive for no para device leak. Uh, can we absolutely exclude? And uh, no, um, has the percentage of leaks compared to the classic device or 2.5, uh, there's definitely much, much less leaks. Can we absolutely exclude it? No. Um, and that has to do uh, with the difference. Uh, the idea is uh, um, whether they can have a device large enough to accommodate even the largest left atrial appendages. As you know, the current flex device uh, the size is between 20 millimeters and uh, 35 millimeters. Um, and the advantage of a flex device, as uh, Brian pointed out, is that the height is only half of its width. So we can really accommodate it to appendages that have a wide orifices, but that are relatively shallow. Unfortunately, there are still devices, uh, there are still left atrial appendages that are beyond the 35 millimeter uh, device that are wider than it's the widest device and therefore inevitable to have some uh, para device leak. And the other is, is really the, the, the presence of uh, the morphology in the presence of the chicken wing that is also depends the size of the entrance neck relative to the wing. And if the uh, entrance neck is very short, uh, then there may not be enough uh, of the tensile strength to hold that device in place and the device might tilt into the chicken wing causing secondary para device leak. And traditionally we used to always report the morphology of the appendage uh, and still do uh, for that reason. So we know how best to approach the appendage where to do the transeptal puncture. Do you think um, that reporting the morphology of the left atrial appendage is still necessary with this new flex device? So we, uh, we really always uh, report the shape of the device. And I would say that the newest technologies uh, from Philips, uh, which is uh, the glass view, uh, allows us to really immediately demonstrate the appendage shape which is much in a much easier and much more intuitive way that we did it with the cross-sectional views, whether it's a 2D or classic 3D. Uh, 
so therefore we can really show all of these devices and as you know uh, if you're in the procedure and you do fluoroscopy and you do injection uh, of, edged, of uh, iodinated contrast in the left atrial appendage, you see that it's a much more complex that uh, we used to see it on a 2D or uh, biplane imaging. So now with the uh, glass, you can really tell what the shape is. The shape still does, in our experience, still uh, is important, uh, less important than it used to be with the classic Watchman device because of the size and the shape uh, of the newer devices. But again, uh, chicken wing morphologies can still be um, challenging, just as I said, because of the length of the neck. If the neck is too short, uh, its uh, chicken wing can still be a challenge. And the other, as uh, Brian pointed out, is really the transeptal puncture. It's not transeptal puncture is appropriately done and sometimes not done anterior enough. There could be a challenges to placement of the device. One of the things that we used to joke about back in the, the, you know, the days of Watchmen 2.5 is we joke and say we would know the kind of day we were going to have based on the morphology of the left atrial appendage, right? And so with these complex anatomies, particularly with even cactus morphology with just stiff pectinate that it was challenging to, uh, to get the device fully deployed and fully opposed to tissue, uh, I, I think to, to Lucy's point, what we would accept with Watchman 2.5 and what we would be pleased with with Watchman 2.5, we might not be as pleased with nowadays with Watchman Flex. And we would take more caution to bring that device back to the true ostium of the, the appendage and try to get, as you say, Dr. Sark, uh, a, an ideal result if we can. Uh, but as you mentioned, there are still those very challenging anatomies, those chicken wings and, and the large ostiums that are 33, 34, and 35 millimeters that that we just would not feel comfortable closing. But also you pointed very nicely, one of your, uh, one of your clips demonstrate the proximal lobe, which are very deep pectinate muscles, and it showed the device got caught into the distal yeah. lobe, leaving the proximal lobe uh, open, which is uh, still, it was a flex device, correct? You know, the first one was a 2.5 device. Uh, uh, I got caught in the pectinate, but yeah, we've had problems with even flex. Flex device. Mm -hmm. the device elongates. So in challenging anatomies with a lot of pectinate, where we as we used to size up the one device larger, we actually might aim for a lower level com of compression in an appendage that doesn't have as much depth. Thank you for, for reviewing for those concepts with, uh, with everybody. Um, I just wanted to echo the comments earlier about the presentation, uh, Byron, that was, or Brian, that was really great. Um, I wanted to piggyback off of the, the topic of shape and appearance of the um, appendage and ask about the integration of 3D imaging in terms of measurement and device um, uh, selection. And any thoughts on, on how you all integrate it with the other pieces that you've spoken about? So this is a question for Brian or? Either, either one of you. I think both of you, both of you use 3D quite a bit, I'm sure. And, and I think I uh, have some expertise there as well. I, I can start with that. I'm curious to hear what Dr. Sarek has to say. So in our experience, um, we start with 2D measurements uh, by trans uh, esophageal echo, but really I've been doing a lot of 3D multiplanar reconstruction to size the appendage and choose an appropriate device size. Um, I use it a lot for defining where that landing zone is at the high angle view, because sometimes it's difficult to see where that uh, infra posterior wall of the appendage is. And multiplanar reconstruction, which I use on the cart, by the way, um, helps me define exactly where that landing zone is. And there's actually data out there that suggests that CT provides kind of the largest osteal diameters when compared to 2D echo. Um, 3D echo falls somewhere in the middle. And I think the reason that CT shows us a larger size appendage is actually twofold. One, patients are not fasting for a, a CT, right? And the other is those prominent pectinate, which generally start inferiorly and posteriorly. The contrast of a CT penetrates through those pectinate on the posterior aspect of the appendage, whereas it can be more challenging to see um, with uh, TE. 
So I would echo that exactly. I mean, the, the, the use of 3D echocardiography um, in this situation can be looked at twofold. One is the multi-plane reconstruction in which we essentially from a 3D data set can be reconstruct 2D equivalent 2D views. And those equivalent 2D views then should provide the same measurements as the straight uh, 2D measurements. Um, as it's pointed out from the prevalent protect trial, uh, we settled on four canonical views, 0, 45, 90, and 135 degree angles. The challenge in measuring the landing zone diameter, which will be uh, important for the sizing of the device, is that actually true anatomic markers um, of measuring the landing zone typically exist only at 45 and 90 degrees and to some degree of 135 degrees. But it's a 45 and 90 where we truly have anatomic markers intrinsic to the image, which is the left circumflex artery and uh, the, uh, the ridge, the, the left atrial appendage ridge. And in those, we can really tell because of the height or the, or the location of the left circumflex that where the landing zone is. The most challenging probably is the measurement of the landing zone at zero degrees because there are no anatomic markers. And that's where the uh, 3D multi-plane reconstruction uh, allows us to measure the landing zone at exactly the same level, which is typically a blue plane uh, level. And then using reconstruction images that you can get the zero like, 45 like, and 90 and 135 degree view, you can go through the entire left atrial appendage, and then you can actually measure truly the landing zone at the same level. Uh, with respect to measuring directly from the 3D reconstructed images, let's say the UNFAS view of the left atrial appendage, that is not, uh, it has not been shown to be really um, uh, precise, the way it's precise, it just has to do with the nature of 3D uh, image, and we do not do that, but we do that with the multi-plane reconstruction. We also do, um, do CT imaging in patients who may not have a pre-procedural um, pre TE, but uh, we do CT and we do virtual CT software that can emulate any TE view. Uh, and in those images, we can really do the same measurements, but with the caveat that the CT measurements tend to be larger by about two millimeters compared to uh, 2D and 3D uh, TE measurements. Yeah, I think that's a great point and a great teaching point, actually, for the fellows and the sonographers that are on the line, that when you use the multiplanar reconstruction, that you are measuring um, at the same plane. Um, and I think that doing this 3D on FOSS view also gives you a helpful look at the morphology of the ostium, whether it's circular, which most are not, or elliptical, which most tend to be. And, and that explains why you get such various numbers at different angles when you're sweeping through the appendage in 2D. Um, you know, we got a question here in the, uh, from the audience from one of our structural fellows. Um, he wants to know that even after some leak, um, if you still have some leak after multiple adjustments and retrieval, would you still deploy the device? Um, or, and is there any correlation between the para-device leak and subsequent risk of stroke? I know we touched on it a little bit, but if you can maybe expand. Dr. Sarek, that would be wonderful. So um, uh, it's still we will guide it with respect to para-device leak. Uh, we are guided with protect and prevail trials in which the acceptable leak was characterized as a vena contractor of five millimeters or less. Um, the, and the assumption is that if the leak is too small uh, to have even if the clot forms inside the device, the escape route is uh, too small to occur. Uh, and it's still we would do if there is no other way that it's an acceptable leak. Many of these leaks, as Brian point, nicely pointed out in the, one of the, in his presentation, they might actually close off. And they close off because there is an intra-device uh, clot formation. And it's beautifully shown on your image. And uh, particularly with the flex device. So the flex device tends to really clot off um, pretty after several weeks of implantation. And that's actually then it cuts the para device leak. And uh, conversely, if on a, a 45 day or six week follow up, we see a lack of uh, clot formations inside the device, that essentially uh, might be that there is a persistent uh, leak that allows for washing into the device. So 
we can look at it either way. But it's also the, uh, with respect to the size of um, the league, um, the pr protect and prevail trial showed that it's a, just a, a, being a contractor with at a one, two D slice. But if you now switch to, let's say that we're talking about the Tava valve, we wouldn't do just on a Tava valve, we wouldn't say just the width of being a contractor at a particular level. We would also talk about the percent circumference involvement with the para, uh, paravalvular leak. So you can say logic can be applied to watchman device. Unfortunately, there are no standards that say, because sometimes the para device leak can be three millimeters, but can involve 20% uh, of the circumference. That's completely different than somebody with the four, four millimeter para device leak, which is a localized to a single um, part uh, of the device. And the, but the other aspect, uh, the, the question is whether there is, uh, there is no, to the best of my knowledge, there is no definitive association between the presence of a leak uh, and um, uh, the risk of subsequent uh, 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 events unless the leaks are very large, but then that it's a very similar to what happens with the surgically ligated or surgically closed device where there is a potential to embolize. But in principle, with these small devices, it's unlikely. We, in, our, in our practice, we, we actually share your practice, Dr. Sark. We, we aim to not leave a leak if possible, but as, as we've discussed, that's not always possible to walk away with no leak. So we aim for the smallest leak we can at the time of implant. If it's five, six, seven millimeters, that's a real problem. And that's something that you, you hope you don't have to walk away with because if still present at 45 days, I wouldn't feel comfortable taking that patient off uh, oral anticoagulation because they don't fit the parameters of our pivotal trials. Um, back in the days of Watchman 2.5, it wouldn't be uncommon to walk away with a two millimeter leak Nowadays, we really hope for no leak, but occasionally you'll have one to two millimeters at the time of implant. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on, um, on gutters. And sometimes in patients, when you have a prominent shoulder, um, you may have, uh, well, we call it gutter, um, which is basically a, a communication a small area between the watchman device and say the limbus or the coumadin's ridge, you know, that's not pectinate, it's not um, technically the appendage, you know, what are your thoughts on that in terms of thrombus leak uh, or thrombus formation? And do you feel comfortable leaving these gutters if they don't communicate with the body of the left atrial appendage? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you pointed out, there is a difference between a para device leak and a gutter. Uh, and a, by definition, gutter has no, it's a, a gutter is a pocket as uh, lined with the smooth uh, wall, non pectinated wall that does not communicate with the inner part of, of the device. And that's really because of the shape uh, of the appendage. Uh, and it's not unusual that we would leave a small gutter placed unless, because that it's simply, it's, a, it's not, uh, it's a smooth walled, so the clot formation is unlikely, and there is no direct communication with the device. However, large gutters can exist if there is a larger proximal lobe in which the device gets caught in the distal lobe, and then that it's a really, it's a much larger area that it's maintained, and there is a possibility of clot formation. But uh, is it acceptable to leave some degree of a gutter? I would say yes, and we have done that in our practice. Uh, us as well. Uh, I, ideally, no gutter. And I, I think one of the changes in technique that's developed over the last few years to reduce the gutter flow, in addition to the, the flex device itself, has been customizing our transeptal puncture. So we used to run into quite a bit of gutter with these chicken wing morphologies, Watchman 2.5 device. We needed to get all the depth we could. We'd wind up in the wing and then we'd end up with this, this you know, moderate sized gutter. And now that we've started approaching from a more anterior stick in wing anatomy, we've been able to reduce that gutter somewhat. We can't get rid of it completely in many cases, um, but ideally smaller, the better if possible, much easier said than done. 
I wanted to change gears a little bit and ask a question uh, from the chat that came in much earlier. Uh, you spoke about multiple people being involved in, on the team here for getting these devices and, and there was a question about the role of the sonographer. And I was curious about your experience at your institutions in terms of how the sonographers are involved, as well as uh, amongst your um, collective experience from colleagues around the country as well. Brian, I want to take it. Uh, so I'm probably not the best example. I would love to have our sonographers involved in our, um, in our structural heart cases. I am a better transthoracic reader having done transesophageal echoes. And I think it would be quite valuable for our sonographers who are uh, performing transthoracic echoes the majority of their time to be able to participate in our structural heart interventions as well as our TEs. Unfortunately, um, at our center, we haven't had the ability to get dedicated time for them, um, but that's something that I wish we could do. And I know that there are uh, many centers that have sonographers highly involved in these cases. And I wish that's something that we'd be able to do at our center. I mean, we tremendously value the input of our sonographers in all aspects of echocardiography, particularly transthoracic echocardiography. As you know, uh, lactational appendage is uh, rather difficult to visualize on a transthoracic echocardiography, uh, maybe in a two chamber view um, and occasionally short access view at the level of the auric valve, appendage can be visualized, but not insufficient uh, to exclude the thrombus or the size device. Um, and our sonographers I have learned tremendous amount, particularly from the TAVA experience, but with respect to left atrial appendage, um, our sonographers are not involved that are really a tremendous, we do 40,000 studies a year, um, and not, not everybody can be everywhere at the time. It's really valid their experience, but uh, we had, they are not involved in the intra-procedural uh, TEH. I also wanted to ask um, about the role of ICE and intracardiac echo uh, in your experience. It seems like this is something that's center dependent from speaking to the reps who, who are present, um, but it seems like there could be some risk stratification in terms of imaging modality choice, um, you know, that could be prevent a, a person from going in having ICE and then realizing it's too complex, for example, for, for that to be used and your thoughts on limitations, appropriate use, and how to define that better. Brian, wanna take it? Uh, sure, so we are not an ICE center. Um, I, I think that you're right, it is center dependent and you have to have an experienced operator. Um, if you are not someone that is used to using ICE, um, your first few left atrial appendage occlusion should not be done with the use of ICE. Uh, one of the things that operators need to understand is that in order to adequately visualize the appendage, you're not going to have your ice catheter in its typical location. It's not just going to sit inside the right atrium. Many times these devices, uh, these ice catheters are being put through a second transeptal puncture into the left atrium. Sometimes they're being put out into the left superior pulmonary vein. Sometimes they're going submitral to get that high angle view that we have on TEE. So it's important for the procedurals to understand that if they are going, in fact going to use ice, um, they may not be used to where the catheter needs to be. Now that may change in the future as 3D ice becomes more widespread, but that's uh, most centers at this point are not using 3D ice. So I would say that um, ice or intracardiac echocardiography can be uh, typically a partial replacement on trusses of the GL echocardiography during this procedure. Because there are clearly some people who cannot undergo um, uh, trusses of the echocardiography whether the patient with esophagectomy uh, or some serious esophageal pathology. But the ICE is emerging, even if it's a par partial replacement of uh, trusses of the echocardiography as a general movement to simplify the procedure uh, and the simple, and the decreases the number of personnel involved in the lactational appendage occlusion. Uh, historically, uh, transesophageal echocardiography was done pre-procedurally, intra-procedurally, and post-procedurally at all aspects of it. But that requires um, uh, really dedicated and experienced 3D echocardiography. So what's emerging now that is it could be a hybrid approach 
in which many patients who undergo left atrial appendage occlusion, they might have had, for different reason, uh, a gated CT image. Uh, and many patients who, or, or dedicated CT imaging for left atrial appendage uh, sizing and shape characterization. So in that hybrid approach, we can use a pre-procedural CT to determine the size of the left atrial appendage, bearing in their mind that uh, two millimeter larger diameters on the CT. Now that we have those diameters, and also we can, again, we can use a software that can emulate uh, T views from the CT data sets. We, for instance, we use a three Mencio that has the whole pile and we can reconstruct 0, 45, 90, 135 degrees easily using that software. So now that we have a sized uh, device, then we can go into the procedure um, using ICE as intracardiac echocardiography to guide uh, that procedure with the caveat, as Brian pointed out, that really requires imaging of the left uh, atrial appendage from the right atrium, from the pulmonary artery, and sometimes also doing the transeptal and going into the left atrium and, visualiz uh, and visualizing the left atrial appendage. But the current technology, you cannot uh, produce equivalent views 0, 45, 90, and 135. Um, however, you can produce some uh, views, whether it's the long axis, sometimes even the short axis of the left atrial appendage, and you can judge uh, with the color doppler the presence or absence of um, uh, leap. So ideally, we would like to have a 3D, but I would not be surprised that in the future will be a hybrid CT ICE um, as the novel way to approach this procedure. Yeah, advanced echo imaging is, is really helpful in, in, in certain um, structural heart procedures. And I know multiple members on, on our panel today also have echo fusion technology. Um, so do you find that echo fusion technology helps in this, uh, this structural heart procedure? And if so, how? Um, I would say we do, uh, I mean, routinely use echo fusion. The major shortcoming of echo fusion that has to be the same manufacturer of the uh, ultrasound system, 3D echo, and the fluoroscopy or cardiac catheterization lab. So if you have a Siemens machine, ultrasound machine has to go with the Siemens cath and the Philips machine with the Philips cath. So it's a major limitation, but if you do have that, um, it could be useful in the overall experience of uh, uh, structural heart disease. In our own institution, we do routinely with every single paravalvular leak closure, whether it's the mitral aortic or uh, position. Uh, with the Watchman device, we do not uh, use it uh, routinely. Part is the technical aspect because we have a mismatch between the uh, ultrasound system and the cath lab, but uh, I can see some utility in that, for instance, in challenging transeptal puncture, where you can really determine where the exact uh, transeptal puncture is. But with respect to the appendage itself and imaging, uh, we haven't used it um, to any significant degrees as opposed to uh, other procedures. Mm -hmm. The important thing is, I guess, to you, we have all these tools in our toolbox and knowing when to use them and how to use them. And, and thank you for, for that insight. You know, I think we can talk all night about this, um, but the hour has really flown by. And, and I want to thank uh, every everyone that joined in and our panelists for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, this is the first of four of our mini series for structural heart. Um, and our second uh, lecture is going to be on August 9th on mitral valve intervention. So I encourage you all to join in and to tell your colleagues about our mini lecture series. So thank you again. And we really appreciate you logging in tonight. Lucy, thank you so much for organizing this great event. And uh, Marsha, thank you so much also. I really appreciate them, Brian. Great work. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Have a great night.